Okay, I had to talk about trolley problems last week, and as a result, I have some thoughts on the subject in a semi-orderly fashion. So why not? Let's let's talk about trolley problems. Now, a trolley problem involves some scenario, some thought experiment, where we have to decide whether to allow a runaway trolley or train car to kill several people, or to save those people by taking some action that unfortunately kills someone else. The standard version of the trolley problem is uh, basically this. There's the, the runaway train car, and it's going on the tracks, and the tracks switch a little bit up ahead, and the tracks are currently set so the train's going to go this way. But over here, there's five people on the tracks. So the train's going to go this way, and it's going to kill five people. But if you switch the tracks, you can make the train go this way, and it will still kill one person. There's five people on the tracks here, one person here. It's going to kill the five, but if you switch the tracks, you could save all five of them by killing just one, or taking the action that unfortunately leads to the tragic side effect of killing just one, if that's a better way of phrasing it. For an introduction to the standard Charlie problem, I recommend the short and wonderful video you can find by doing a search online for Little Kid Charlie Problem. The Little Kid video, uh, uh, the Little Kid Charlie Problem introduction video is the best. It's, it's magnificent. Now, uh, some trolley problems get more complicated, or more dramatic, or more ridiculous. There's actually one where um, the train's going this way, and there's five people on the tracks, but there's also a bridge, and there's you on the bridge. And you think that if you, put, if you throw the right thing off the bridge onto the tracks, it might stop the train. And you can't volunteer because you're not big enough, but there's a really fat guy on the bridge. You can push the fat guy off the bridge so his corpse stops the train and saves... These five people. Should you kill the fat guy is one version of the trolley problem. Uh, this version of the trolley problem is briefly dealt with in uh, another video that's worth watching. Um, do a search for I'm in love with your philosophy. I'm in love with your philosophy. Uh, that video, uh, I, I don't know, philosophy love song music video uh, briefly deals with um, that version of the trolley problem. Now, after this intro, the remainder of this video will have three sections. First, Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill. Second, Aristotle. And third, just me. Now, what do Kant and Mill say about this? Uh, from what I can gather, some people say that Kant says that we should not take any action that leads to killing people, even if it means more people die. And I think some people say that Mill thinks we should take any action that leads to fewer people dying, even if it means our actions kill some people. So what they say is, uh, Mill says, switch the tracks. Um, kill one to say five, and Kant says, don't switch the tracks. Um, never kill anyone. You're reducing this one person on the tracks as a means to, to, to the status of a means to the end of saving the other five. And I think uh, this, this way of thinking is uh, an almost complete failure to understand both Kant and Mill. So first, Kant doesn't actually say no killing. What he says is always follow the categorical imperative. Now that means don't treat human beings as mere means to an end, but always treat them as ends in themselves. Now, you can treat people as a means to an end, just not merely as a means to an end. Always treat people as ends in themselves, and never just as a means to an end. That's what Kant actually says. And uh, I think you have to consider uh, the dangers of treating uh, those five people as a means to the end of, uh, of not hurting that one person, as well as the importance of considering not using that one person as a means to the end of saving the five. So, um, uh, it's not as simple as no means to an end, therefore, don't switch the track. And Kant, and Kant never says no killing. What else does Kant say? He says version one of the categorical imperative, always act according to principles that can be universalized. And I think it's reasonable to say that speaking Kantianly, uh, drawing from the groundwork for metaphysics of morals by Kant, you can say that any principle that can be universalized and therefore meets the test of categorical imperative version 1 is a principle that should be always followed. So Kant says that, but it's not the same thing as no killing. And it's not immediately clear, if it's clear at all, that it has anything to do with not switching tracks. Uh, now, second, let's remember what Mill says about the usefulness of general rules. Now, I introduced this on my channel. Uh, search for um, uh, J.S. Mill's Arguments for Honesty, and you should find my video on the subject. 
Mill explains in Chapter 2 of Utilitarianism that uh, the rules we've inherited from the past are rules we have inherited because they lead to greater happiness. So although greater happiness is the point, that doesn't mean that we don't need the rules. In fact, it means we do need the rules. We have rules because we've learned from the past that they lead to greater happiness. The rules do have occasional exceptions, Mill thinks. But you certainly do not undermine the rules lightly. Rules like never killing innocent people are super duper important. And it's very dangerous to undermine a rule like that. It is uh, occasionally the case that maybe, maybe a rule has to be broken for the greater happiness. But it's a really high bar. There's going to be, if you undermine a rule that leads to greater happiness, some long-term effect from undermining that rule, a negative effect, a bad effect, some, uh, some lessening of human happiness. And that happiness... Uh, has to be weighed against any po uh, lessening of happiness has to be weighed against any possible gain of happiness you get by breaking the rule. So watch it. So Mill looks more like the position we associate with Kant if we look at Mill carefully, and Kant looks more like the position we associate with Mill if uh, if we look at it carefully. Particularly if whatever principle says you should switch the tracks is a principle that can be universalized. Now, what do Kant and Mill actually say about this? I think Mill says you should switch the tracks in the simple version of the trolley problem. I think Mill says uh, don't do nothing and let the train kill five people. Switch the tracks so that it only kills one person. I think Mill says that. I think Kant agrees. I, I mean, I can't even speak for Kant as such, but I think the, the methods for knowing right from wrong action in Kant's Groundwork for Metaphysics and Morals lead to the same answer here as they normally do with Mill. And it may be more than that, but, you know, all in good time, God willing, I hope to get to uh, a more systematic investigation of the much stronger agreement between Kant and Mill than most people realize is there. In more complex versions of the Charlie problem, uh, let's just say this. If you think that John Stuart Mill, the utilitarian, would recommend killing someone to save more lives, find out exactly what is the principle behind that action. What principle justifies the kill one to save five action you think John Stuart Mill would recommend? Make sure that principle is articulated in enough detail to respond to the details of this particular situation, to the specific circumstances and not something that can be arbitrarily applied to significantly different situations. Let me try to say this again, uh, uh, rephrase this. Make sure that if you think Mill would approve of killing one to say five in some different version of the trolley problem, make sure you know exactly what principle you think motivates his actions, uh, motivates that decision, justifies that decision, and Make sure you've articulated that principle in enough detail that it can't just be arbitrarily um, abstracted to a completely different set of circumstances. Make sure it applies to this situation and doesn't apply to any other situations that are significantly different. And then ask yourself if that principle is universalizable. If it is, Kant's method of knowing right from wrong agrees with Mill. And if it doesn't, then that principle is not universalizable and either you've botched your understanding of what Mill says. Uh, you've, botched, you, you've botched the articulation of the principle that justifies the action you think Mill would recommend, the version of kill one to save five. Either you've botched the articulation of the principle or, or uh, you've botched Mill and Mill wouldn't actually recommend killing that person to save five. At any, at any rate, let's, let's move on to Aristotle. What does Aristotle say about this stuff? Now, I guess I, I don't know for sure, but here's what seems to me to be a pretty good Aristotelian position. Here's, here's, here's the Aristotelian position. Shut up. This is ridiculous. This is just silly. Shut up about these stupid moral dilemmas. The study of this stuff is about 0.000001% of the study of ethics. The solution of moral dilemmas like this is about, well, 0.000001% of ethical living. Ethical living doesn't involve solving dilemmas like this very often. The study of ethics doesn't involve solving dilemmas like this very often. This is a question for the experts, meaning people who have become virtuous. Your job is to do that. Your job is to become virtuous. That's your job right now. Your job is not, at this time, to solve a moral dilemma fit for an expert. You are not an expert. You are not virtuous yet. Become virtuous. That's your job. 
If you want to even think about moral dilemmas like this, first master the basic concept that motivates Aristotelian ethics, the concept of human proper function. There is such a thing as the proper function of a human being. There's such a thing as the proper function of a teacup. The teacup is for keeping the tea warm and safely delivering it to my stupid face. That is its proper function. The pen has a proper function, the stapler has a proper function, and a human eye has a proper function of seeing, and the hands have the proper function of grasping, and so on, and the human being has a proper function. The human being as a whole, the soul as well as the body has a proper function. Learn that, and start living according to the proper function of the human being. That's your job in Aristotelian ethics. First master the concept of human proper function and the basics of the study of human proper function, and then maybe you can move on to advanced topics and in, in, in moral questions. So I like to use an illustration when I represent the Aristotelian criticism of trolley problems. Uh, here is a medical dilemma for you. You're, you survive a plane crash. You happen to be able to swim to a deserted island. And on that island, you have available fresh water, meaning not salt water, meaning you won't die of thirst if you drink this water, but it's got snails in it. And you remember that some snails carry the Bilharzia parasite. So your question is, do you drink the snail water? It's not fresh, sparkly, running water. It's not straight out of a spring. You know, it's, it's mostly still water with freaking snails in it. Do you drink the snail water so you don't die of thirst? Or do you um, uh, wait one more day, hoping for a rescue, hoping you don't get uh, too, too weak or too ill from thirst before, uh, before some rescue plane shows up on the horizon? And if you do wait one more day, on that day you can ask, do you, do you drink the snail water? Or do you wait one more day? And actually, the answer is at some point you should drink the snail water. Better to risk Bilharzia parasites than to die of thirst. At some point you should drink the snail water. But the dilemma is, do you drink the snail water on the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day? Actually, each day is its own dilemma. I'm pretty sure the answer is don't drink the snail water on the first day. Somewhere before the tenth day, drink the snail water. But I don't really know on what day you should drink the snail water. I'm not at all sure. Um... <laughs> what I said about the first and the tenth day. This is a question for a doctor. This is a question for an expert. Now, this is a real medical dilemma. Somewhere around, I don't know, maybe the third or fourth day, you do have a real medical dilemma, and I don't know the answer to it. And you could debate um, the dangers of thirst versus the dangers of parasitic infection or something like that and, and set up this supposed conflict between different theories in medicine like um, Kant versus Mill, instead of Kant versus Mill, you'd have uh, the doctor who represents the dangers of parasitic infection versus the doctor who represents the dangers of thirst and have some, some supposed debate uh, between them and tell the student in medical school that you just have to decide which is the greater danger uh, as if it's a, an a non-rational decision. Which one do you side with? Like when, when we're led to believe that we're supposed to side with Kant or Mill based on some arbitrary decision, do we think it's more important that we have good motives or that we have good results? Come on, it's not even what Kant and Mill say. And it's not what doctors say. What you need to do is, if you want to solve that medical dilemma, start by understanding medicine. Start by understanding the way the human body functions. There might actually be a time in medical school when a medical dilemma like that would be useful to discuss in some class in medical school. But you do not do that on day one of med school. It's not something you spend hours and hours discussing on your first day at med school and having some interminable debate over should you drink the snail water or risk uh, another day of thirst waiting for a plane to show up that might not show up. You don't spend hours debating that at the beginning of medical school and pretend you're studying medicine. That's not studying medicine. Studying medicine is learning the proper function of the human body. And once you've done that, once you've been through a proper course of study in how the human body functions properly, then you can approach a medical dilemma like the snail water question. Similarly, with trolley problems, start with learning the proper function of the human being. And then maybe later you'll be in a position to study uh, some advanced moral dilemma like a trolley problem. So.
Uh, that's what I think is a, a, an Aristotelian position on these issues. Now, there may be other Aristotelian positions. I mean, find, find passages in, um, in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics where he talks about justice. Uh, I'm not going to promise anything, but I think there's a very good chance you'll find some, some insight there that does help to solve at least some version of a trolley problem. I'm not saying Aristotle doesn't answer any trolley problems. I'm saying it's silly to debate trolley problems a lot and act like you're studying ethics when you haven't done the first step in studying ethics, which is learn the proper function of the human being. Anyway, I'm repeating myself. This is an Aristotle... Uh, position and what do I say about this? Well, I agree with Kant and Mill and Aristotle. Now, I think when we study ethics, we spend way too much time talking about tricky decisions and difficult situations. We spend too much time with Kobayashi Maru scenarios, to use some Star Trek terminology. No win scenarios. Those rare situations where there's no right answer, or at least there's no good answer. There's no answer, uh, there's no solution that's not tragic. We talk about this stuff as if that's what it means to study ethics, but this is a tiny, tiny sliver of the study of ethics. And in any case, the whole point of studying ethics is to go out and live ethically. There's another Aristotle point. Let me read you the slightly modified text of what I wrote to a student in response to the student's remarks in an online reflection assignment. I believe the student had said something about trolley problems where all the answers are wrong and we can't help regretting the outcome no matter what we choose. So here's what I said. Are they all wrong? Would we have regrets if there was nothing we could do? I could probably save more lives by donating O-negative blood under false pretenses. For example, by taking blood pressure medication that they probably don't allow, so they measure my blood pressure low enough. But that would take cheating or lying, and it corrupts the system, and it destroys trust, and it probably harms my character, and has a strong chance of hurting more people in the long run. So, I don't worry about it. If sometimes I can't donate blood as often as I'd prefer to, there's nothing I can do, and I don't have to worry about a life I couldn't save, or didn't save, only because I couldn't. I don't have to worry about a life I didn't save, only because I couldn't. Meanwhile, I have so much moral advice that's been given to me in the philosophers. Advice about the golden rule, advice about loving my wife and kids, about doing a good job at work, about almsgiving, about practicing habits that make me virtuous, about loving God and my neighbors, etc., I already have enough moral advice from Confucius, Kant, Mill, Aristotle, Augustine, enough to fill a lifetime. I know these things are my responsibility, even if I can't save every life in every single situation. I know these things are my responsibility. So now, uh, speaking in the present, I say, do you want to study ethics? Study that stuff, and then go out and live it. Once you're well on your way to figuring out advice from a few of the great ones like Kant or Mill or Aristotle on how to know right from wrong in tricky situations, then maybe apply that to thinking about some trolley problems. That's fine. But I don't advise you to worry about trolley problems until you're well on your way to learning the basics of ethics, the not-so-complicated real-life lessons from the great philosophers. Even the basics, like the negative form of the golden rule, do not do to others what you want them not to do to you, even the basics like that can take a lifetime to put into practice, as Confucius says to his disciple Zigong. So be good. And that will be your best preparation for a real-life moral dilemma anyway. You want to face your next moral dilemma as a person with good character, so my advice is get started on that. And anyway, if more of us had good character, we'd have a whole lot fewer real-life moral dilemmas anyway.